Good morning, Grace Church. Hey, we're so glad that you're with us this morning. You guys ready to worship the name of Jesus? How many believe that he's turned your life around? Amen. How many believe that he's better than anything the world could offer you? Believe that? Go ahead and stand your feet this morning. We're going to declare that together. We're going to sing praises to him this morning. Search the world, but it couldn't fail me. Man's empty praise, treasures that fade, I never know. Then you came along, you put me back together. He's now satisfied here in your love. No, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better. together. 
glory. He turns our beauty from ashes. God, we thank you, Lord, this morning for your holy presence in this room, God, for your redemptive power at work in our hearts, God.
Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Can someone praise him right now for the healing grace of God manifest the saving power of Jesus Christ in this room today, Father. We thank you. We praise you. We give you the honor. We give you all the glory, Father God. What a joy and a privilege to come together to honor you, to praise your holy name, Lord God, the beauty of your holiness, Lord, knowing that you are in our midst, that your train fills this temple, that all have equal access to your saving grace, your healing power, your provision in our lives, your direction, your wisdom, Lord God. We thank you, we give you honor, we give you glory as we reach out and we say thank you. We praise you, we give you honor, we give you all the glory. And all the people said, amen, amen. amen. You may be seated, praise God. It's so good to have you here with us, worshiping together with us. We want to thank all of you that are worshiping together with us online. Happy Mother's Day to all here and all that are online. Happy Mom's Day. And I hope you're having a good day so far, and it's only going to continue to get better as the day continues to go on. Not only today, but that your life as a mother would continue to be graced with an abundance of God's grace and wisdom and peace and patience and patience and more patience. So moms are great. Thank God for moms. Amen. Let's give it up for the moms this morning. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, I'm excited to share God's Word with you today, so we're going to jump right into that, and we'll continue to follow after what the Holy Spirit has in store for you. I want to put out a disclaimer this morning before I share the Word with you that I'm not responsible for anything that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about today. <laughs> All right, because we're going to be talking about transformational thinking. Everyone say transformational thinking. You know, God wants to bring transformation in our lives. He's always in the process of transforming us more and more into his image, into his likeness each moment of every day as we continue to walk with him and, and, and are in union together with him and have this interdependent relationship with him. Uh, we are dependent on him, and he's also dependent on us. There's some things he's depending on us to, to do and to respond to and also responsibilities we have here as his children, covenant children here on the earth. In Romans chapter 12, I'll read the first two verses, but uh, you know the, all the preceding uh, chapters here in the book of Romans is really just laying out our doctrinal position of who we are in Christ Jesus as a result of Christ's redemptive work on Calvary's cross and how that is to uh, take effect in our lives and having an effect in our lives. And so it gets to chapter 12 and it says, and so dear brothers and sisters, you know, as, as, you know, because of everything I just shared with you, I'm pleading with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Verse 2. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. See that? God wants to transform you into a new person as a result of having been born again, which is receiving Christ as your Lord and Savior, receiving Christ as the one who forgives you of all your sin. You come into this new relationship with God and referred to as a new birth, a new creation, or here it's referring to as a, as a new person. And God wants to make you into this new person as a result of Christ having come to take up residence within you in the spirit realm, but also in this natural realm. There's a transformation process that, that, uh, that's taking place, and God wants to be working together with you, but he also wants you to work with him. It's that in interdependent relationship. It says, uh, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. So God's doing his part and we're doing our part and our part is to change the way we think. And, and, and as we continue to change the way we think, God continues to bring about a transformation in our lives. So and it says that then you will know, learn to know God's will for you, which is good pleasing and perfect. So Father, I thank you this morning as we look into the word of God. We yield ourselves over to you and we give permission to the Holy Spirit of God to do a work in our hearts as we engage in the process of changing the way we think 
and participate in the transformational work that God is doing in our lives, desires to do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So transformational thinking is much more than making a mental commitment that, you know what, I'm going to change my ways, I'm going to change the way I think. Certainly that's a good uh, a starting place, but it really, it needs to be um, a work of the Holy Spirit. First of all, it requires a commitment to the work of the Holy Spirit within you. In Ephesians 4 and verse 32, we are, uh, uh, we are admonished to let the Holy Spirit renew our thoughts and our attitudes. Let the Holy Spirit do it. How many people have ever tried to, you know, many times you hear it at the beginning of the year, people make New Year's resolutions, going to say, I'm thinking I'm going to do different this year. I'm going to be positive. I'm going to think positive. I'm no longer be, I'm, I'm no longer be pessimistic. And, you know, and that, that's it. You know, that's all well and fine, but you know, within, within the hour or within the day or within the week, you find yourself being pessimistic about something. You find yourself being negative. You find yourself having a thought that you didn't want to have. And so and that's why the scriptures, it's, uh, on numerous occasions, you find in the scriptures that it's a work of the Holy Spirit. And Ephesians 4.23 is certainly uh, one of the predominant ones where it's really saying, let the Holy Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes. So I want to encourage you to open up and allow the Holy Spirit to have his way. And beyond just a verbal, mental assent, say, okay, Holy Spirit, have your way, and then, then no longer be engaged with him or, or be thinking about what he may be doing, but to really be engaged in the process, to be present in the process of, what, of the work that the Holy Spirit is desiring to do within us. So that's what's required. Uh, first of all, uh, it's a work of the Holy Spirit, allowing him to renew your thoughts and attitudes. And uh, number two, also, it's a, this process requires a learning, a learning to listen to God's wisdom moment by moment in every situation rather than relying on our own thoughts and on our own experiences. But as we're going through the day, just practice uh, his presence, practicing being mindful of his presence and, and drawing on his spirit. Whenever you find yourself in a, in, in a position that, okay, I need to make a decision here, I need to make a decision here, and they can come rapid fire. They can come very quick. I understand that. But also know that God is present. Everyone say, God is present. So he's present no matter how fast life is coming at you and how quickly you need to make decisions. Practice being mindful of the presence of God, his wisdom, his knowledge, his peace, his direction for you, for us, that we can constantly be drawing on that and, and learning to listen to what is Christ speaking at this moment and not feel uh, rush to make a decision and then finding out it was the wrong decision, that the thoughts that we're, thoughts that we're uh, thinking are not necessarily the best thoughts. And then we also want to be mindful and I want to encourage you to turn to this particular scripture. It's in Matthew uh, chapter 22 and verse 37. Always be mindful of the greatest commandment. I'm sure most of you know it. You can quote it to some degree. But uh, here it's telling us that Jesus replied when asked what was the most important commandment. Jesus replied in verse 37, you must love the Lord your God. Let's say it together with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your what? All your mind. I don't know about you, but, you know, for the majority of my Christian life, I was very conscious of the idea of the great commandments to love the Lord your God with all your heart and kind of the, the rest of it kind of just faded away. Soul and mind just kind of like, you know, the idea is, well, it's the most important things you need to love the Lord your God with all your heart. But Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Now, as Nathan encouraged us last week, wasn't it a great word that Nathan shared with us last week? Were you all challenged by that? Well, he encouraged us to, uh, to, to, to learn to be comfortable with mystery, to embrace mystery and keep traveling towards it. So I just want you to be comfortable this morning with uh, heart, soul, mind, spirit. And let's not be trying to figure out, you know, where the boundary of the heart is, where the boundary of the soul is, and the boundary of the mind and the brain. And is the mind different than the brain? Just, just let it all just play out this morning. We're not, this morning's not about that. This morning's about loving the Lord your God with all your mind, all your mind, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, loving the Lord God with all your soul. 
So we're going to learn to love God. And the idea here is, is, is uh, again, coming to a place where we are engaged in a thinking process that, that gives God substance to work with, thoughts to work with, to bring about transformation in our lives. So this means to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and all your mind means, that, means to explore and engage the thinking capacities God has given you in a manner always proceeding from and subject to the Holy Spirit within you. I'll share that with you again. To loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind means to explore and engage the thinking capacities God has given you. A good place to start there would be to acknowledge God has given you, the scriptures confirm this in Corinthians, so that God has given you a sound mind, not a disturbed mind, not an anxious mind. He's given you a sound mind. And so to engage the thinking capacities that God has given you, that he has instilled within us, and to do so in a manner that's always proceeding from and subject to the indwelling Holy Spirit who's desiring to lead you, to guide you, and to direct you into all truth. Now back to Romans chapter 12. In verse 2, we are admonished there, instructed there to not be copying the behaviors of this world, the behaviors of this world. You know, left to ourselves without being mindful of, of drawing on, on, the, on the presence of Christ, on the, on the wisdom of God within us. It, when we put life in neutral, we're, we're going to float along. We're going to just be going along in life along with the rest of the world. And so he's telling us here that we are not to copy the behaviors of the world. That's, that's, that's putting life in neutral and just going with the flow. Well, you're going somewhere, but you're probably not going where you want to go. You're not going to end up where you would like to end up. And then many times you wonder, well, how did this happen or why did this happen? And then we start pondering and thinking and trying to figure things out on our own. But if we engage God in our thinking, uh, draw on the thinking capacities that God has given us and to continually be engaging in the, in the mindfulness and the presence of the Holy Spirit living within us, we can keep our behaviors in check and, and that, we are, that we are no longer copying the behaviors of the world, but rather we are obeying the directives of the Holy Spirit. Being mindful, what would the Holy Spirit, how would Jesus have me respond to this situation? Not just respond like the world respond. And so that is so applicable in so many areas of our lives. I'll, I'll just let that between you and the Holy Spirit, how that's working out for you. But speaking for, about behavior just for a moment, because in, in, uh, you know, we're told to, to change the way we think and, and to change the behaviors and not to be copying the behaviors of the world, but when there's a fundamental problem with the heart and mind, ungodly behaviors and attitudes are the, are the fruit of it. Ungodly behaviors and attitudes are the fruit of, of uh, problems with the foundation. And so we want to be mindful of the foundation of where is our thought life? Where are these thoughts springing forth from? Where did that thought come from? Have you, have you ever had that thought? Have, did you ever think where that thought come from? <laughs> well, you don't have to look too far. It came from right here. It came from right here. Inside. Came from the inside. I didn't plant it there. No one else planted it there. You planted it there. You allowed it to be planted there. But so turn with me, if you would, again, back to Matthew. This time turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 9. I'm going to share you some of the, it's just a few statements that Jesus made concerning thoughts that I think will help us to bring a, a greater discipline into our thought processes. So in Matthew, chapter 9, in the first couple of verses here, this is the story of Jesus he healing a paralyzed man. And then in verse 3, it says, But some of the teachers of religious law said to themselves, and we say, said to themselves. You know, when you're talking to yourself, that's thinking. You're, you're, you're thinking and you're, you're kind of, you're, you're just, it's processing. You're, it's just kind of ruminating in there. You're, you're thinking. And so they said to themselves, that's blasphemy. 
This is a conversation they're having. Does he think he's God? Now, I'll be honest with you, I had seasons in my life, especially early on in being a Christian and being exposed to the, uh, uh, to the, to the work and the walk and the baptism of the Holy Spirit in my life and being exposed to the charismatic movement and being exposed to uh, things I hadn't been exposed to before. I uh, didn't really know they were in the Word, but finally discovered, yes, it's in the Bible, that Jesus Christ is our Savior, Jesus Christ is our baptizer, and yes, Jesus Christ is our provider, and Jesus Christ is our healer. And, I, and you know, I had, I had roadblocks in some of those areas. Now, how much does Jesus, how much is God willing to provide for a Christian? How much should a Christian have or how little should a Christian be satisfied with? Or is Jesus a healer? Would he really heal a person that has uh, some issues in their life? <laughs> Would God heal a sinner? Then I hear testimonies of people that weren't even Christians being healed. And I'm thinking, no, it couldn't be. That's blasphemy. God would never heal a sinner. I had entertained thoughts like that, and I, I, I embraced thoughts like that, and I defended thoughts like that. And, and, uh, so, but you know, the good news is, is we can continue to grow, and we can, we can dismiss our thoughts and embrace his thoughts. But here are the teachers of religious law. Here's a, here's a paralytic that needs to be forgiven and needs to, needs to be healed, and Jesus is there to minister forgiveness and to minister healing. And the, par- and, and the, the teachers of religious law said to themselves, that's blasphemy. Does he think he's God? Now the next verse, verse 4, Jesus knew. Everyone say, Jesus knew. Jesus. That'll shape you up real quick concerning your thoughts and attitudes. <laughs> when you recognize, oh, Jesus knows. You think no one else knows what you're thinking? Jesus knows, and Jesus talks to me. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to tell you all what you're thinking right now, <laughs> all right? Let's start. Who, who, who should I start with? <laughs> I'm just teasing. I have enough. Uh, I'm busy enough keeping my own thoughts in check. It's absolutely astounding, the thoughts in, that can come and go at the most <laughs> opportune or inopportune times. It's absolutely just like it's crazy. So thank God for the Holy Spirit to keep us in check. To keep us in check and thank God that those who are in Christ Jesus, there's no guilt nor condemnation. So when a thought comes that's completely out of the ballpark of what I'm engaging at the moment, I just dismiss it and say, thank you, Lord Jesus. That thought, I'm not going to entertain that thought. I'm not going to allow the enemy to plant that thought in my life. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, going to give any more thought to that negative, judgmental yeah, I said judgmental. I'm not going to give any more thought to that judgmental thought that was, you know, that, that popped up there on my radar. So Jesus, verse 4, Jesus knew what they were thinking. So he asked them, why do you have such evil? Everyone say evil. Why do you have such evil thoughts in your heart? Another thing that I would have had in my life early on as a Christian, I mean, you would have mentioned the word evil thought. I would have, had, I would have defined that as something carnal, something uh, murderous, something sexual, uh, outside of God's plan for sex. I would have you know, just thought of some really bad things. <laughs> but Jesus called this thought that they had, they had this thought about Jesus, well, who, who does he think he is, that he's forgiven this man's sins and he's, that this man's being healed? Does he think he's God? Jesus didn't think very kindly of that type of thinking about him. And so those are the types of things I want us to be challenged in. What are we thinking about God? Where are we limiting God? Where do I limit God in my thought processes? The scriptures teach us in, in Ephesians 3 and verse 20 that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly beyond what we are even able to, able to ask or to think. Isaiah tells us that God's ways are higher than our ways. So I want to challenge us all to be careful not to be putting limits on what God 
is doing and desires to do and will do by our limited judgmental attitudes and thoughts, whether it be about God or other people. We don't want to be shutting the flow of what God wants to do. We, we, we stop the flow and, and the process of transformation in our lives when we get stuck in that type of mindset. So let's free ourselves up from that. I thought for the longest time that God was an angry God. And he's just waiting for another opportunity you know, to, 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 to put something on you, to discipline you. I just thought, thank God for Jesus. God is angry and thank God for Jesus because he came to placate an angry God. Then one day, the Holy Spirit revealed it to me, the scripture that says, you all know it, for God so what? That he gave who? His only son, Jesus. I thought, I used to think God is angry. Thank God for Jesus. He's the mediator. He's, he's softening things up. But then I realized one day, that, you know what? God so loved Let's say that God so loved that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And one day the light bulb went on and I thought, God loved, that's why he sent Jesus. I don't know why I came up with the idea and embraced the thought. Embraced the thought and defended the thought that God's angry and it's only because of Jesus. <laughs> Now, God loved and he sent Jesus. So I don't think God's angry. God's wrath has been poured out on Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ paid the penalty for the sin of the world and God is no longer angry at us. He is, sees us through the lens of Jesus Christ and he sees us forgiven as his children and he thinks highly of us. Amen? Matthew chapter 15, turn to that one. Matthew 15, uh, begin reading at um, verse 15. This is where Jesus is teaching about inner purity, you know, what, what makes a person pure on the inside, and, and also just making sure that we understand that, uh, the, the, you know, the source of that. So I encourage you to read the beginning of the verses as well, but in verse 15, Peter said to Jesus, explain to us the parable that says people aren't defiled by what they eat. The things that you eat, the things that you're taking in in the natural realm. Things you're taking in in the natural realm. Things, here he's saying the things that you eat don't defile you. The things you take into your body, you're going, to eliminate, you're going to eliminate it and it's not going to defile you. But here's what you need to be mindful of. Don't you understand it? Verse 16, Jesus asked in verse 17, anything you eat passes through the stomach, then goes into the sewer. But the words you speak come from the heart. That's what defiles you. Verse 19, for from the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, lying, slander, just to name a few. We can go to other verses and give you more, but you don't need more right now. From the heart come evil thoughts. Then in verse 20, these are what defile you. Eating with unwashed hands will never defile you. And that was pre-COVID. <laughs> Wash your hands. Wash your hands. I was traveling recently and I went to the restroom of this particular restaurant and it, it, it's funny, but it's sad that it's funny. But the restroom had, had the, you know, the, the image of the man and the image of the woman and I also had the image of the family and, and then underneath it said, whatever. <laughs> Just wash your hands. <laughs> Just wash your hands. And so... I just want to put that out there. That was pre-COVID when Jesus said that. So keep washing, but know what it is. He said the, the, it, it's from the heart, from in here come the evil thoughts and ideas that we have a tendency to be pondering and meditating on. So don't be copying the behaviors of the world. Let God transform you by changing the way you think. Wrong behavior is a result of wrong thinking. And wrong thinking is a result of hardness of heart. And hardness of heart is the result of resisting God's wisdom, God's thoughts, which are higher than your thoughts. 
So you always want to keep your heart open and tender, tender to the things of God. You will always move. When you look at your life, you will find a pattern that you are always moving in the direction of your most dominant thought. You will always move into, into the direction of your most dominant thoughts. In Mark chapter 5, it's the story of the, of the woman that had a, had a flow of blood issue for 12 years, went to many different physicians, spent all the money that she had, and didn't get any better, but matter of fact, that she didn't get better, but rather that she got worse. So that's not, you know, that's not very cool when you have an issue going on for 12 years and you just put everything into it that you have and you go to see all the different specialists that you can go see, all the different people that you think may be able to help you, thinking you're going to get better, but you're not getting better, you're getting worse. In Mark chapter 5 and verse 28, it tells us that uh, after she was suffering for 12 years, uh, and verse 27 says, when she heard about Jesus... When she heard about Jesus, so we can safely assume that she must have heard about Jesus, that he is Jehovah Jireh, that he is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord God, the healer, that he is the Savior, that he is the Son of God, the Redeemer. She heard good things about him, and it tells us that when she heard about Jesus, the next verse in verse 28 of Mark chapter 5, she thought to herself... She thought to herself, if I could just reach out and touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. Her most predominant thought at that moment in life was that if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. Now, you can, we can safely assume, I am sure, that that was not the only thought going on in her mind. After 12 years of seeing all these different doctors and spending all the money that she had and did not get better, but rather grew worse. So she also was probably entertaining thoughts that, oh, what if this doesn't work? What if, this is, what if he's just like all the others? What if I press in there and touch the hem of his garment and I'm not made whole? What if I get in trouble? What if they arrest me for being here? Because I'm, I'm, I'm not supposed to be here with the issue that I have going on. I'm not supposed to be in public. But here I am. I'm in public. And I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking that if I just ignore the laws right now. And I'm thinking if I just press in through this multitude of people. And I'm thinking if I just get in there and just grab a hold of Jesus. I am thinking that I'm... I'm going to receive my healing. And her most predominant thought drove her, motivated her, and drove her to the Savior, to the healer. And the scripture tells us that when she touched the hem of his garment, Jesus felt power flow out of his body and into hers. He didn't know who it was. That means he's, he's, he's uh, no respecter of persons. He didn't even know who it was. He just said he felt power flow out of his body. He felt healing power flow out of him into someone that thought if I would touch him, I'd be made whole. So what are you thinking about? What thought is driving you on? What thought is causing you to ignore the naysayers and say, I'm just going to ignore the naysayers. Those thoughts are wrestling. They're coming against me, but I'm going to bring those into captivity. I'm going to cast those aside. And my predominant thought is that if I just get with God, if I get with God, everything is going to change. Everything will change. And please know that when your dominant thought is God and his love for you, his love for humanity, his redeeming power released through Jesus Christ, death, burial, and then his resurrection, when God unleashed the powers of heaven and resurrected Jesus Christ from the dead and then said that that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, it will quicken, it will make alive your mortal body as well. That's the kind of thinking. We need to begin to engage in transformational thinking is God thinking, being God conscious and thinking God's thoughts. I'm not talking about a holier and now person that every time you open up, you have a scripture verse you're sharing with someone. And not just sharing the verse, but you're, you're telling us which verse it is. It's Leviticus 24.3. Is there a Leviticus 24? 
<laughs> sounded good, right? I know there's a Leviticus, and I know it's, a, it's not one of my most memorized portions of Scripture. But anyway, <laughs> you get the point. You get the point. Don't think ill of me. He's my pastor, and he's not even sure. <laughs> Someone look it up for me. I want to know. How many chapters in Leviticus? Jeffrey Miller, where's he at? He knows. <laughs> 27. Okay, I'm good. I'm good. All right. <laughs> Praise God. So train yourself and develop a God consciousness, meaning that you are, your predominant thoughts are going to be pressing in. I'm going to engage my thinking capacities, and, and, and I'm going to be God-minded recognizing that God is present, and on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, I'm drawing on the wisdom of God through the person of the Holy Spirit who now dwells in me. I'm not in this alone. I don't need to make this decision by myself. I know you may feel that way many times, that I'm, I'm the only one that's... I, I'm, I'm stuck with having to make this choice, and I don't want to do it. You're not stuck. God is with you. You and God are a majority. And you can make good choices. Now, there's wisdom in a multitude of counselors, wise counselors. There's wisdom in that. I'm not saying to isolate yourself. and I'm not advocating, you know, uh, aloneness. But there are moments when you are alone and you're, or you, are, you, you don't even have to be alone to feel alone. Did you ever experience that? Some of you in here this morning might feel alone, but you're in here with many other people. But you can feel alone, but always Develop, what you want to do is develop a, conscious, a God consciousness that God is with you. And you can always be drawing on the Holy Spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, what's the right choice here? What's the right choice? What's the right direction? Help me make the right decision. Help me think the way God would think about this. And help me to have the insight that he has for me. Your dominant thought your dominant thought, you want your dominant thoughts to be leading you into the goodness of God, into the love of God, into the mercy of God. It comes to your financial stewardship. What's your dominant thought? He's Jireh. He's more than enough or barely enough. Just, I mean, we can, there's so much we can go on here. That's why we're going to do this for the next couple of weeks. But I just want to, to introduce this to you this morning and challenge you to open up your heart. The very foundation of where thoughts come out of and let's deal with the heart and let's have our hearts right with God and ask him ask him invite him into a partnership in your thinking process in your decision making you will never live better than you think Father in the name of Jesus I thank you this morning for your Holy Spirit work in us. That it's, you are inviting us to allow your Holy Spirit to change our thoughts and our attitudes, first and foremost, toward you, toward your goodness. That we would not be thinking ill of you. We would not be judgmental toward you and wondering why you were good to this person and it appears like you might not have been good to this other person. Lord, we don't see from your vantage point and your thoughts are so much higher than our thoughts. So help us to come to a place where we're trusting you and our hearts are right toward you and we're not accusing you of being uh, respectful, but Lord God... Uh, that you're not choosing one over another, but, Lord, that you are for us and that you are not against us. Bring us into that place, Lord God. Open up our eyes to a whole new level of understanding of your love for each and every one of us. It's in Jesus' name. It's in Jesus' name I pray for everyone in here. And for those that have not made a personal commitment to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, may this be the moment. May this be the moment. If you haven't done that, if you're watching this online or you're here, just... Right now, just, just say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for making me a new person in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Again, I want to thank you for being here. And before we dismiss you this morning, just for a moment here, we want to... Uh, just again, have a little video here honoring the moms. So if you're ready to run that video, that'd be great. Amazing. Oh, 
awesome, beautiful, blessed, caring, extraordinary, fun, giving, smart, happy, helpful, incredible, kind, loving, patient, pretty, great, nice, sweet. Moms are happy and kind. Thank you, moms, for all you do. Thank you, mom, for all you do. I love you, mom. I love you, mom. We love you, mom. We love you, mom. I love you. <laughs> we love you, mom. Love you. You're doing great, mom. <laughs> Kids, man, that's why we do it, right, moms? <laughs> they're cute, they're funny, and they're sweet and sincere most of the time. <laughs> so happy Mother's Day to all you moms. Um, if you haven't met me yet, my name's Kate Henney. I'm the Connections and Student Ministry Director here at Grace Church. I just wanted to let you guys know that summer camp registration is open as of today. So, <laughs> and the lovely Lori Kelly, Keller over there is um, leading it this year as she did last year. So if you have children, grandchildren, friends, neighbors, anyone you know entering kindergarten um, and entering fifth grade this fall, they're welcome to join us for a three-day summer camp, July 17th, 18th, and 19th. It will run in the evenings, I believe from 6 to 8.30. And... 8.05, don't leave them here till 8.30, pick them up at 8.05. <laughs> All right, so all those details are available on our website as well as the opportunity for participants and volunteers. Obviously we can't leave a room full of children, lots of children, so we need lots of volunteers to help us teach these children, have fun with these children, and to show them the love of God. So if that's on your heart to do, sign up your kids, sign up yourselves, um, to be volunteers as well. So you can do that at mygracechurch.com slash summer camp. And also we have a wonderful event coming up today, or not today, this month. So May 21st is our serve day. And this time serve day, we are partnering with Opportunity House. And there's a couple, there's actually three different ways that you can get involved. You can serve or donate. And there's two opportunities to serve on May 21st. So May 21st, we will be preparing and serving breakfast to about 70 people living at Opportunity House. And they house men, women, and children. So they're doing a wonderful ministry here in Berks County. So if you would like to help um, prepare and serve breakfast, it is early. They eat at 8 a.m. So we're asking volunteers to be here at 6 a.m. that Saturday morning. Um, you can do that at mygracechurch.com slash outreach. And then if you can't make it to make breakfast that early, we are, asked, we are building a team to go to the op shop, which is their thrift store that they use to support their own ministry. And there'll be a team going to sort donations and to just give them some extra help on that day. So the time frame for that would be 10 a.m. to 12.30 on May 21st as well. And so once again, to sign up and to serve for either of those opportunities, you can do that at mygracechurch.com slash outreach. And then to donate, they actually gave us a list of things that they really are in need of. That list, if you saw it this morning as you walked in in the lobby, there is a list there of different things that they specifically said they're in need of right now. So you're able to pick up those items and donate them here in the lobby of Grace Church um, by May 19th so that we can take them with us on May 21st. And that list is also available at mygracechurch.com slash outreach. So there's three different ways that we can all come together and show love, show God's love here in Berks County by partnering with the Opportunity House. Um, so before we go today, I just wanna remind you all, it is Mother's Day, in case you forgot. We have that lovely photo booth out in the lobby and I'd encourage you to, if your mom's not here with you today, take a picture and send it to her. All right, if your mom's here today, grab her and get her in the picture. Tell her she looks beautiful and there's no excuse not to take a picture with you, all right? <laughs> and then also, um, if you know, grab some coffee, grab some water while you're waiting to do that as well. If this is your first time here at Grace Church, just wanna let you know we are so glad that you joined us, especially on a holiday. I know holidays can get busy. So we're so glad that you joined us. And before you leave today, um, as you're leaving the auditorium, you'll see a banner on this part. It's on my left. So as you stand up to leave, it'll be on your left as well. It says connections room. I'm gonna be back there as soon as I step down from here. And I'd love to greet you and meet you. And we also prepared a lovely gift for you. 
And then for anyone, if you have a need for prayer today, in the same area, there is a team back there um, led by Jason, and they'll be happy to pray with you for any need or request that you have. So lots to do today, lots to enjoy, go forward, and I'm excited for the rest of Pastor Ray's series on transformational thinking. Y'all have a blessed Sunday, and we'll see you next Sunday at 10 a.m.